study this evening. Genesis chapter number 22 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. And I, I don't feel, you know, uh, I don't feel like I'm going overboard by saying this. I think it, it could be just even trying to be objective. Maybe the greatest story that is told outside of, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross, the greatest story that is told in the Bible. The, the depth of this chapter, there's going to be layer upon layer that I'm going to be pointing out tonight. The depth of this chapter really just proves the majesty and the power of God's Word. A lot of what we're going to see tonight is symbolism. We're going to see a massive amount of symbolism. But not only that, the Bible itself is the greatest storybook. The greatest storybook that, is, that has ever been pinned down. Number one, the majority of the storybooks that are written, of course, the stories that are told are fables. They're not true. So, of course, we have that going for us with the Bible, that these are true stories. And a lot of the times when you look at the movies, like a lot of the, the, the cinema movies, the blockbusters and things along those lines, when they have like a great plot line, it'll oftentimes come from the Bible. A lot of the, the plot lines of just uh, bestsellers, they'll steal little things like stories of, along the lines of Samson and Delilah. You know, going behind enemy lines and falling in love with, you know, someone of another, you know, kindred or something like that and putting yourself in a danger. They're always trying to steal little things from the Bible. It's because the Bible is the greatest storybook. And it's because it's of reality and God dealing with mankind. But it, it's a, Genesis chapter number 22 is a great chapter. So I just wanted, you, wanted to prepare you before we get into this. We're going to do a lot of uh, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. So be prepared to turn tonight. Genesis 22, verse 1. I want you to look there in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. It says this, And it came to pass after these things <clears throat> that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Now, first off, right here, Genesis 22, verse 1, I want you to keep your hand here, of course, this being our text, and I want you to go over first to uh, James chapter number 1. I'm going to show you, uh, you know, a contradiction, a parent in, in many people's eyes, contradiction. They'll try to point out uh, from comparing James chapter number 1 to Genesis chapter number 22. This is a very critical text in the eyes of those that, that despise God and hate God. They'll try to mock the story when Abraham is commanded by God to take his son that he loves to sacrifice him on the altar. Many atheists will try to mock and make fun of this. And they'll try to critique God and talk about how evil and sadistic that he is. And this is one of the points that they'll normally bring up also. I've heard this from specifically atheists before. So if you'd have noticed, I'll read it to you again. Genesis 22, 1 said this, And it came to pass after these things that God did, that, I'm sorry, yes, that God did tempt Abraham. So it says that God did tempt Abraham. Well, they'll compare James 1 with Genesis 22, 1. I want you to look there in James 1. Look at verse 12. We'll read first. It says this, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Then it says this, verse 13, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Some people say, see, I got you. We got a major contradiction here. Here in James chapter number one, it says that God doesn't tempt any man. But then we go back to Genesis 22, one, and what does it say? It says that God did tempt Abraham. This comes from just the, the, the lack of people's understandings of number one, of reading context, and then and then not understanding the vastness and the richness of a of the of vocabulary just in general, of words not being limited to one specific use. I want you to turn over to Hebrews chapter number 11. Now, we're going to be turning to Hebrews 11 probably five, six times tonight. So Hebrews chapter number 11. If you're smart, you can go ahead and slide a bulletin or something in there and doggy ear your Bible if you're comfortable with that. In Hebrews chapter number 11. I want you to look at verse 17. This particular verse we're going to read again here in just a moment. But here in verse number 17, it says this. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. So we can see by comparing Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, and James, we see the exact same statement both times used interchangeable. Now, number one, Genesis 22 said that he tempted Abraham, didn't he? That God tempted Abraham. We compare it to Hebrews 11, and it says that God doesn't tempt any man. Well, first off, the best way to find the definition of a word 
is to look at the context specifically that it's in. And a perfect example of this is the word repent. The word repent. Now, when we look in the King James Bible, sometimes people are called to repent of doing evil, aren't they? As in doing bad works. As in repent of the works of their life that they're doing, aren't they? Perfect example is Jonah. The book of Jonah. When Jonah goes to Nineveh, he goes in there and tells them to repent. And what do they do? And it pleases God, so it's obviously in accordance with the definition of repent of what he means. What do they do? They repent in sackcloth and ashes, and they're turning from their evil way, the Bible tells you. So the commandment of repentance in that sense was what? It was a repentance of turning from their evil works, wasn't it? Their sinful way, they're repenting of their sins, okay? Well, let's take that same definition and apply it to Genesis chapter number 6 when the Bible says that God repents. Does that mean that God is turning from his sin? Well, no, of course not, because the Bible from beginning to end is very explicit that God is not a sinner, that God has no sin, and he is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. So you see how you can't be so narrow-minded when you use a word and you try to define it. So we have to look at the context to see of what is being repented of, right? Well, that's exactly what you have to do here. You have to look at the context and see what particularly a person is being tempted of. And what does it mean in James chapter number 1 when it says that God doesn't tempt any man, right? What was the context of James chapter number 1? What did it tell you? It said that God doesn't tempt any man. It talks about evil. Evil. It talks about God not tempting any man with evil. And then it goes on in the next verse. I already dropped my spot, and I don't want to focus on this too much. But in James chapter 1, if you look at the very next word, verse, it talks about how a man is tempted of his own, he's drawn away of his own lust, and then he falls into sin. So it's specifically referring to the fact that God does not tempt man with sin. God does not tempt man with sin. The purpose of this temptation was that God was trying Abraham's faith to see if he would be obedient to him. He wasn't tempting him to get him to do something that was sinful. He wasn't tempting him to go commit fornication. He wasn't tempting him to go commit adultery. He wasn't tempting him like Abraham. Why don't you go steal something over there? That's not what God was doing. So you have to look at the context and see what it means. And James chapter 1 tells you that God doesn't tempt man to commit sin. That's what it's saying. That doesn't mean that God won't try to won't try you in any way or won't test you. And that's what is actually a perfect definition of Genesis 22:1. What does it mean when God is tempting Abraham here? It's saying that he's testing him. He's trying his faith. That's what it means. So that's a silly, you know, a, a, you know, supposed contradiction that people try to pull out in the Bible. We see by comparing scripture to scripture to the people that would claim that they don't understand the Bible. They don't know the Bible. So look there in, back in Genesis 22. Well, I want to point out something at the very end of the verse right now that's going to keep coming up. It's a common thread, and it's one of the reasons why Abraham is such a great example to us today. It says at the very end, Behold, here I am. Notice, when God calls to Abraham, what does he do immediately? He responds, and he's ready, isn't he? He says, Behold, here I am. That's what we're going to see throughout this chapter is the great faith, yes, but also the great obedience of Abraham. I want you to look at verse number 2. We have a lot of meat in verse number 2. It says this, And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now that's a, a tall order, right? I, mean, I can't even really express you know, a statement to, to, to really summarize what God, the fullness of what God really just asked him to do. Now, I want to remind you of something quickly, and I don't believe that this is the primary application because primarily the purpose of the Bible is to point to Jesus, right? And that's what this chapter does. But I want, you to remi- I want to remind you of something quickly before I get into what I believe the main application of this is. What just happened in Genesis 21? Does anybody remember? What's one of the main things that happened in Genesis 21? Exactly. Hagar and Ishmael, they're sent out. <clears throat> what is Ishmael to Abraham? It's his firstborn. It's his what? It's his son, isn't it? Now, I want you to think about that. Now he comes to him, so God, and God was a part of that. You can't get around that. God told him, hey, I want you to listen to Sarah. That's when he told Abraham, go ahead and send, her, send him away and send her away. I'm going to make a great nation of them too. So God was a part of that, and God went ahead and confirmed, hey, Sarah's right, send him away. Now what does he have left? <laughs> One son, doesn't he? 
And then God comes to him in the very next chapter. And I don't realize, I don't, I don't you know, know 100% the time span in between these two events. But either way, we see that we're left with, as the reader, chapter 22, God tells Abraham to send your son away. You know, in a very traumatic way, it says that he grieved him, making it seem as if he's not going to see him anymore. We see in chapter number 22, God comes to Abraham and says, hey, I want you to sacrifice your son for me. That's pretty, uh, you know, severe, isn't it? That's pretty, that's, that's, that's pretty hard to handle. You know, that's a, that's a talk. It, it would be, you know, it's a lot anyways. But to have both of those events happen back to back, that's extremely grievous, isn't it? That's extremely grievous. Now, of course, when we see the wording here, he says, uh, you know, he said, Take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac. Many people are like, well, that's not his only son. Well, there's two applications to this. Number one, the one that I was just now talking about. Many people will say this. When they, if they grew up in a situation where their father wasn't there, what would they say? I grew up without a dad. Have you heard that many times? Did they grow up not having a dad or was their dad not alive? That's not what they mean, is it? They're saying I grew up and my father wasn't there. But they say I grew up without a dad. Well, that's one application that you could use here. He says, take thy son, thine only son. His other son had been dismissed. His other son is not in the picture. He doesn't have a relationship with his son. That's why people will say, I grew up without a father. I grew up without a dad. It's the same concept of now he has one son, doesn't he? He has one son left that's there with him. But there's a much deeper, stronger application. The primary application is the spiritual application here, I believe. I want you to turn to John 3.16, most famous verse in the whole Bible. Probably everybody here could quote it, including all the children. John chapter number 3, verse number 16. John chapter number 3, verse number 16. <clears throat> a couple of the things that stand out to me when we read uh, here in Genesis 22, 2, it said this again. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son. So he stretches, stresses that it is his only son. Then he says this, whom thou lovest. So he tells him a little detail. And it's funny that he uses this as exact language, which it makes sense that he would because he's tempting him or trying him. He's at the same moment of telling him to go sacrifice his son. God emphasizes the points that would make it more difficult to sacrifice your son. Think about that. He says, take thy son, thy only son, whom thou lovest. Now, of course, the Bible, you know, being written over many, many, you know, thousands of years, I believe it's right around 1,700 years or so, you know, we have totally different authors. <clears throat> we have the, the Bible, Old Testament being written in Hebrew, the New Testament being written in Greek. But with our King James Bible, that being, of course, we believe perfect and translated perfectly, we can cross-reference verses, and it's very important to pay close attention to every word. If you believe, like I preached the other night, that every word is, is perfect and preserved in our King James Bible today, then you, we need to, as King James Bible believers... Pay, pay close attention to the specific words that are employed, right? The, to the specific words that are used. He says, take thy son, thine only son. Then he says, whom thou lovest. Look at John chapter number 3, verse number 16. It says this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, what do we have here? We have, of course, God talking about the Father, talking about God that is in heaven, the one and only true God, right? But then we also have his son mentioned. And who is that? That is the Son of God. That is the one true God being born as a man, being manifested right in the flesh. And here we, we, we see a verse that's talking about how God, the Father, is willing, and he loves the world so much, he's willing to sacrifice his only begotten son because of his great love. What does Abraham ask, or what does God ask Abraham? Hey, Father, hey, Abraham, I want you to take your one and only son that you have, and I want you to take him, and I want you to sacrifice him for me, the son that you love. The Bible talks about, why does it say here, you know, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? It took great love for God to be able to sacrifice his son, didn't it? That's what we're going to see here when we look at Genesis chapter number 22. There's layers of symbolism, but number one, one of the main you know, components to these layers is this. I want you to pay close attention to the figure of Abraham being the father, and of course Isaac being the son. 
Also, I want you to turn over to Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11. Where we were before. Hebrews chapter number 11. Oops. I should have taken my own advice. I'm going to put a bulletin in here. Hebrews chapter number 11. I want you to look there in Hebrews chapter number 11. Where we've read before in verse number 17, it says this. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises, watch what it says, offered up his only begotten son. Now, it's interesting the language that is used here because, you know, uh, I've done this before. I'm not going to spend time on this right now, but I've defined what the word begotten means. And it means to be conceived, right? His only conceived son, the only son that he actually brought forth that was conceived, right? Well, that's what begotten means. Now, if we apply that in a very literal, literal biological sense, does that seem to be true? No. It doesn't, does it? It doesn't seem to be true. Why? Because his son, his firstborn son, was Ishmael. And that was, when we understand the definition of begotten, that was a begotten son, wasn't it? I want you to turn over to Romans chapter number 9, verse number 7. Romans chapter number 9, verse number 7. Again, the language that is being used is very specific. We believe the King James Bible is perfect. And the reason why God chose there to refer to Isaac as Abraham's only begotten son is because he's referring to him figuratively as the seed, as Christ. Once you look in Romans chapter number 9, verse number 7. Romans, look at verse 6 first. It says this, Not as though the word of God has taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Now, Israel, of course, was the uh, ended up being the son of Isaac. And then it says in verse 7, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. I want you to let that set in for a minute. It says, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. What is it saying? That they're not really Abraham's children in some sense, right? Do you understand that? Just because they're the seed. Wouldn't it sound ridiculous if I said... Not everyone who is my seed is my child. Wouldn't that you'd be like, what in the world are you talking about? Well, of course, this is speaking in a spiritual sense. If I was speaking literally, it would make no sense, right? But if I was, if, if you know, the Bible, like it is here, it has a spiritual application to it, and you understand that it makes perfect, absolutely perfect sense. It says this, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. Now look at the end. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Saying what? Saying not in Ishmael. Ishmael, when he looks, he doesn't account him as his child. He doesn't account him as his seed. He's saying in Isaac shall it be called. Ishmael is not his child. In what? In a, uh, of course, spiritual sense, not a physical sense, not a biological sense. So in that way, what was he? He was the only begotten son of God. He didn't regard Ishmael because he was born after the flesh. He was not born after the promise. And that is what matters. Just like when it comes to salvation. You know, that's what God stresses all throughout the New Testament. He doesn't give a rip where you come from and who your daddy and mommy is. That doesn't matter at all. What matters is whether you're the spiritual seed. And God goes so far to say that Isaac, Isaac was... Abraham's only begotten son. So that's how it, it works just the same way with Jews today, with Jews, you know, 100, 200, a couple thousand, all the way back, you know, to when Ishmael and Isaac were there. He looked at them, you know, if, if, if let's say Isaac was the only one that believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and of course this is an allegory here, but of those two, the other one was not his child, he was not of that seed. God would not regard him of the seed of Abraham. He would not be, you know, of the, the child of the children of Abraham and would not be a child of God in that sense either. Go back to Genesis chapter number 22. So that's how you explain that when it says that Isaac was his only begotten. Cross-reference Romans 9, 7 there where we saw. And it tells you that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That's he's speaking spiritually, of course. So we're going to keep reading here. I wanted to, uh, there was one other verse. We'll, we'll keep reading. We'll come back to it. So notice there at the very end, he says, Whom thou lovest, he says this, And get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Can you imagine that? Just, you know, like I oftentimes do, I want you to put yourself in his shoes. And God coming to you, and you've got to make this personal. Think about one of your children. Think about maybe if you only, you only have one son, or think about your firstborn son, and God coming to you and saying, Hey, Take your son, your only son whom you love, and I want you to take him and offer him, you know, 
on, there are no mountains here, I don't know where you would go, on a mountain in Georgia or something, right? I want you to offer him as a burnt offering. Can you imagine being asked that of God and you knew that it was really the Lord speaking to you? Can you imagine you being put in such a situation like that? Look at verse number three. It says, and Abraham rose up early in the morning and sat on his ass. I pointed out last chapter how Abraham rises up early in the morning. Why? Because he's not lazy. It's important to get up early. I'm trying to motivate you guys. Get up early. It is important to get up early. Brother Russell and I are doing some work. This Saturday we're replacing this carpet. And I told Brother Russell, I'll meet you here at 6 a.m. We're starting early, right? Amen. Look, use people in the Bible for an example. You know, you, you only get one life. Don't sleep your life away. I preached a sermon about Amen. talking about, you know, you know, a little sleep, a little slumber. Why don't you take that number that I told you to calculate a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday night? And I want you to factor in all the time that you're going to be sleeping, too. Why don't you add that in there? To, you know, subtract that out and then look at that number. And then maybe you'll say, maybe Brother Hall and Brother Russell aren't that stupid to sleep only four hours a night. You know, so it, it's important, man, to, 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 you, to be productive with your time because you don't have much. Especially to be productive with your time in a spiritual sense. Amen. Right? Doing things for God. You know, waking up early and doing what? What do we see him doing? Waking up early and he's ready to do work for God, isn't he? He's ready to do work for God. We see the great obedience of Abraham. Number one, we see him being obedient in really one of the most difficult situations that could possibly be asked of you, isn't it? Not only that. He's rising up early in the morning when he's asked such a thing. Can you imagine? You know, wouldn't you at least be, be deterred in some sense? Like, man, and stop and think about it. And, I, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do here. Should, you know, should I do this or should I do that? You know what else this shows? That Abraham, and God, we know that he loved his son because God said that he did, number one. But number two, it shows that Abraham loved God more than he loved his son. And you may think that's crazy, and if you do, there's something wrong with you. That you, you, know, you should love God more than above anything or anyone. You should love God above your family. You know what happens if you put your family first? You'll destroy your family's lives. But if you put God first, then you'll guide your children because you love God. You'll keep His commandments. And even if you know, even in the sense of you know, you, you see all these worldly people out there, right? That aren't that aren't Christians, aren't saved. If they were to at least keep God's commandments, because that's how you show love to God. Right? Even if they were to just keep God's commandments in their lives, that would be the best thing for their children. You understand what I'm saying? So, loving God is keeping God's commandments. So, if you love God and put Him first, you're automatically going to love your children because you're doing the best thing possibly for them. You're raising them up in the Lord. You're setting a good example for them and all of those things. But here in verse number 3, we see it says, And Abraham rose up early in the morning. So we see his obedience. It says, And saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. I, I'm sure that's horribly difficult. And clave the wood for the burnt offering. So in this morning, it looks like this is when they cut the wood. They prepared the wood. It says, For the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Verse 4, Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Verse 6, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife and they went both of them together. I want you to notice how descriptive this chapter is. The Bible's not always like that. So don't read over things. Notice how the, how the, the gears change. You notice what he keeps pointing out? Look at the end of verse 3. He says, And clay the wood for the burnt offering and rose up. What's it talking about specifically right now in your mind? Before you've read the end of the chapter. It's talking about Isaac, isn't it? You skip down, you look at verse number 6. It tells you that he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went, both of them together. What's it, what, is it, what picture is it painting in your mind right now? Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, you know, what, of course, he's going up there to do. It's a, it's a, it's, it can be very graphic. It can be very scary. You know what he's trying to do? He wants to stress to you the great love that Abraham has to God. That's what he wants to stress to you. He wants to stress to you the great love of what Abraham was willing to sacrifice for God. Here, what we see in, in uh, verse number 7 is we see in verse number 7, it said, we'll, we'll read it first. It says, And Isaac spake 
unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? So as I said, we see the great obedience, the great love that Abraham had for God there, but we also have that other layer here of, of symbolism, which is Abraham representing God the Father and being willing to sacrifice his only begotten son. Now notice in the same way Isaac was Abraham's only begotten son. He's referred in Hebrews chapter number 11, of course, representing Christ. What do you see happening in verse number 6? It says, and Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and then it says this, and laid it upon Isaac, his son. What's that wood for in, in, in Abraham's mind? That wood is the, is the wood that his son is going to die on. You know what that wood represents? Is notice at this point, they're heading to the location. And where is it located? It's on a mountain. Where did Christ die? On a mountain, right? He died on the mountain of Calvary, right? It's referred to as a mountain many, many times. The mountain, and actually, when you study, I, don't, I was going to go into this, but I'm not going to. Mount Moriah, he tells them to go to Mount Moriah. Well, Mount Moriah is actually, uh, when you study the Bible, it's the same place where uh, David went and sacrificed to God when he had tempted the Lord by counting the people, right? And that's actually the same exact location where Solomon ended up building the temple. So where they're going exactly to right now, specifically, type in the word Moriah if you have a Bible app after the service, and you'll see that it's where the temple was built. Now, I've thought about this a lot, and it says that he was built, you know, or that, that, he was, uh, that Jesus was sacrificed on a mountain. Now, if, if, if everything was taking place there at the temple, and they're traveling you know, to, uh, to the location where he's standing before Pontius Pilate, the Jews are going from the temple to Pontius Pilate within just a couple of, uh, you know, at, at within an hour at least. I mean, an hour of walking isn't very far at all. But the Bible talks about in, he in the book of Hebrews that he suffered without the camp, right? It talks about him suffering without the camp. I don't know. I've heard a lot of people say that it's on the exact mountain. but And I don't know if it's on the exact location of where... Uh, it's obviously where the temple is built. That We know that the temple was built on a mountain. But I'm going to get into that in a moment. I don't want to go too far in the rabbit trail because it's going to tie in with something we look at in a minute. I, wanna, I wanna, don't want to get ahead of myself. But here in chapter number 6, we have, we have Abraham laying the, uh, laying the wood upon his son. This, this symbolizes the cross. That Jesus carried up the hill. This is what that symbolized. The Bible talks about you know, him dying on a tree. Of course, the cross was made of wood. He lays the wood of the, of the burnt offering upon Isaac, and he has him carry this up there. Not only that, we, we know that there was obedience on you know, the Son of God's part, wasn't there? On Jesus Christ's part, to be willing to die. We know that he prayed and he prayed to God the Father and said, not my will, but thine be done. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He was willing, wasn't he? Right? Well, of course, this being figurative, we can also see that because when you look in verse number 7, it says this, and Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, my father, and he said, here am I, my son, and he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Does it seem like he's kind of catching on? Seem like he's kind of wondering. Or, do you understand what I'm saying? He realizes there's something not right. When we skip over, we'll read this in just a moment. In verse number 9, it talks about Abraham taking Isaac and tying Isaac up. Now, Isaac being, you know, let's say he's, he's, he's you know, 12, 13 years old or so. He's, he's old enough to be able to carry up this wood. He's a teenager at least. His father is 100 and, you know, however old. He'd be 113, 50, 115 years old. You think Isaac would be able to get away? Think about that. Most likely, would you say? You know that? that to me, I, if I had to take a guess, Isaac would be able to get away. He ties him up. We can read about that in a moment, as I said. He, he says he bounds his son, and he lays his son on the altar. Don't you think he could get up? You know, we, so what you always see that is you see the obedience of the son as well. Yeah. Why is he asking the question? Something's not right. You know what he does anyways? He goes anyways. He realizes, where is this burnt offering? We've offered sacrifices before, but there's something missing right now. And he goes anyways, doesn't he? Just like the son. What, is, what does Jesus say? As I quoted, he actually says, 
when you look it up, my father, in that exact verse. He, when he prays to God in that verse, he says, my father, and then he tells him, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. What does Isaac say here? My father. And he said, here am I, my son. The exact same wording. Also, verse number six, we, if you, uh, Matthew chapter number 11, Jesus talks about the taking, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Jesus, of course, bore our sins. He was carrying that cross. He was carrying our punishment up, up that hill, wasn't he? That's what we see with Isaac here, carrying the wood of the burnt offering, symbolizing the cross, which was our sins and our punishment he was going to take upon himself. It says there at the end of verse 7 again, let's read it once more. It says, Behold the fire and the wood, <clears throat> but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Verse 8, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them together. together. I want you to, to stay here, of course. Go to John chapter number 1, verse number 29. John chapter number 1, verse number 29. <clears throat> now if we look at... The immediate and the literal application, we see that God is going to be, or Abraham is going to be sacrificing his, his biological son, right? Isaac, he's being asked to sacrifice his son, Isaac. <clears throat> Abraham knows, he's been promised, right? He's been promised that of his seed will someday come the Messiah. Of his seed will someday come he who will reign, the promise that was ultimately given uh, or, or prior to this given to Adam and Eve. So he's waiting on this provision, isn't he? Abraham is waiting on this promise and on this to be fulfilled. <clears throat> we see it fulfilled in, in John chapter 1, look at verse number 29. It says this, The next day John, this is after he baptized Jesus, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. So we see who is that Lamb of God. All throughout the Old Testament, of course, after Abraham, you know, we have Isaac, Jacob, and all the tribes. They uh, ultimately ended up uh, starting the nation of Israel. God instituted the commandments. And so what did they have to do? What did the nation circle around? You know, they were they had to take their sacrifices to the temple. It was all, you know, uh, you know, encompassed. The sacrifices, the temple, everything that was done there, wasn't it? That was what connected them to their relationship with God because that was the symbolism at that time that looked forward to what would someday come. So what did they have to do all the time? They had to offer sin offerings. They had to offer what? Burnt offerings. They had to continually offer up sin offerings, burnt offerings, peace offerings, free will offerings, just continually, right? You know what all that was pointing to? Is pointing to the true Lamb of God that would someday come and replace all of those offerings. The Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Now at that time, just like Abraham did here, they, they, uh, the perfect wording would be what the Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians, how they, how they see through a glass darkly. In the Old Testament, that's what they did. They saw through a glass darkly. They didn't know exactly how it was going to work out when the Lamb of God showed up and that it was going to be God himself. Now I want you to go back to verse number 8. <clears throat> Think of that in your mind. How we see Jesus coming. What does it say? Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. That's what John the Baptist said, right? Look at verse number 8 one more time. It says this. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for, for a burnt offering. Now of all of the double applications in the entire Bible, this is by far, this is by far the greatest. So there's two meanings to this, of course. Number one, it tells us God will provide himself a burnt offering, right? Well, we see that in John chapter number one, don't we? We see that being played out if we look at the first layer of what, of what I'm touching on right now, Genesis 22. What? The father offering the son. Offering his only begotten. Isn't that key? His only begotten son. His only conceived son. God fathered Jesus Christ, didn't he? God fathered Jesus Christ, and he was therefore the Son of God. He was born on this earth, and he had you know, uh, the mental capacity of a human being. He had everything that a man has outside of sin, didn't he? And God loved that man. That man was obedient to all of his commandments, and God loved him. You know what he still did? 
He still had him die for the sins of the world. God provided that lamb, didn't he? He provided that lamb. He sent him forth when he, when he uh, ordained him at, at the time of his baptism and all of that. He sent him forth into the world to begin his ministry. But not only that, because a lot of people will, they, a lot of people, of course, uh, you know, that, that believe in the, the Catholic Orthodox Trinity, they believe that there was this conversation that took place between three people. I'm not really preaching anything right now. They believe that there was this conversation that took place between three people, and the consensus was that the second person of the Trinity is going. There's three people there with three minds. They all have their own thrones. They're all just sitting there. And person number one and person number three, you know, they say person number two should go. You know, and they would say, of course, well, person number two said he would go too. Okay, I'll give you that. That's, that's, that's a fairy tale, my friend. Right. That's not what happened. Right. That's not how it works. There's one God. There's the mind of the Lord, singular. There's one God who is in heaven. That one God came down and was born on this earth as a man. Amen. While simultaneously remaining in heaven, great is the mystery of godliness, he fathered a child that was born on this earth, and he loved that child, a real man who lived on this earth. Amen. If you can't understand that, well, you're not God. That's why you can't understand that, but great is the mystery of godliness. The Amen. Bible point blank tells you it's a mystery. Amen. If you understand it because of your th three-person trinity, well, maybe your three-person trinity is wrong. Right. God fathered the child. The child was born. He loved the child. But guess what? He was the child all at the same time. Right. You know what you see in this chapter is you see the father loving the son and laying the wood on his son, don't you? He lays the burden upon his son. But you know what? It doesn't stop there. Because the second layer of symbolism we see when the ram steps in. You know what? In the, in Jesus, it says about Jesus, Jesus says himself spiritually, when it's quoted, it says, uh, in the volume of the book it is written of me. So yes, Isaac represents Jesus, but so does this ram that comes into play here in just a moment. And it's the ram that God provides. And notice the wording one more time. It says, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. You know what he did? He provided his son. He laid the wood upon his son. He laid the cross upon his son. He laid the sins of the whole world upon his son. But guess what? Simultaneously, God loves the, the earth and the world and all people that have ever lived so much that he also was willing to take that burden upon himself. Right. That he also was willing to die for the sins of the whole world. Amen. God will provide himself, Amen. himself right. a lamb. Right. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Amen. God didn't just have someone else do it. God did it himself. Amen. His arm brought salvation unto him. Right. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 18. <coughs> Second Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 18. This, you know, this isn't, isn't emphasized as much, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 18 in this debate, but it is super powerful. It is super strong. I want you to, I'm going to expose with this just for a moment in light of what we just read, where it talks about, he, Abraham says, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. The two meanings of that are, number one, God provided his son. God fathered the son. God was in heaven, and he allowed his son to go to the cross. He sent his son to go to the cross. He loved his son that was obedient unto him. He sent his son, number one. Amen. Number two, God was manifest in the flesh. The same one God. There's only one God, the Father. God, the Father. I don't care if that makes you uncomfortable or not. The Father was manifest in the flesh. There's only one God, the Amen. Father. Amen. And he was manifest in the flesh. He Amen. came, and he was born on this earth as a man. Right. So I want you to keep that in your mind while we look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 18. It says this. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Now I want you to notice what it said. It said all things are of God. Okay, God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. So I want you to notice the distinction between God and and that he reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. So what does it mean? God used Jesus Christ to bring us unto himself. Who is that referring to? 
I'm not going to turn to all the scriptures, but I can easily show you that it's the Father. Right. Jesus, the, the, the Son, is the mediator right. to the Father. You know, right. He's the way to the Father. Right. He provided the way to the Father. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, he said. Right? Amen. So he's the one that's taking us to who? The Father. Right. God reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. So there's a distinction there, isn't it? So everyone would agree. It's the Father. It's talking about the Father, right? You're in big trouble. Look at verse 19. To wit, that means to know or to understand, that God, who are we talking about? The Father. That's right. That God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Amen. Not imputing their sins unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So did you catch that? It says that God, that's the Father, there's one God. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Amen. Well, who reconciled the world? Who actually did the reconciling? Who actually died on the cross? Who was it? Christ. Jesus. Christ. So it says that God was in Christ. Why? <laughs> because God is a spirit. Man. That's what it's referring to. And oftentimes, it does make the distinction between the flesh and the spirit. We can see this all throughout the, all throughout the Bible. The Bible talks about how in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Right. So notice that the Godhead dwells in him. Amen. So notice where there's a distinction between Godhead and him. It's talking about the flesh. Right. Saying God dwelled in him. What is it saying here? That God reconciled the world here to when that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. What is it saying? God, the Father, was in Christ. You know, yeah, you know, the father, and, and they'll literally go this far. Literally, I've heard people say this. So Christ, you know, he's the son, manifest in the flesh, the son of eternity past and, and all that. He's the son manifest in the flesh. Like his spirit is, is, is the son of God also. Like his soul is the son of God in heaven, all right? And then he comes and he's born on the earth as a man. So you have the son of God in the flesh. Now, that's not a reference to the flesh, the son of God. Make sure you're following. Then you have... Also, simultaneously, when Jesus, because Jesus talks about the Father being in him all the time. He right. says it constantly. Right. They literally say that there's more than one spirit and that just the Father was dwelling in him. And these bunch of idiots have the audacity to try to look at me and say, you believe in a schizophrenic God. You literally believe that this man walked around with multiple persons in him. Right. That's the definition of schizophrenia. Right. And they'll try to say, oh, you believe in a schizophrenic God. No, you just don't understand the Bible, you stinking idiot. When it says him, it's talking about the man, Christ Jesus, and it's saying that God dwelled in him. Who is it? The Father. The Father dwelled in Christ. The Father, through the man, Christ Jesus, being a man, he, he himself reconciled the world unto himself. He brought the world unto himself. Why? Because he died on the cross. The one and only true God came down and was born on this earth as a man, and he reconciled the world into himself. That's what happened. Amen. Amen. But you know what? That same God was in heaven. You know what? That same God sent his son to the cross. Right. Great is the mystery of godliness. Simultaneously, he sacrificed his own son on the cross, but guess what? That one and only true God is so amazing and so powerful that he also at the same time died on the cross. Amen. He reconciled the world unto himself through Jesus Christ and he did it himself at the same time. At the very same time. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Amen. He provided it who was the man Christ Jesus and he provided himself as a lamb. Go back to Genesis chapter number 22. Genesis chapter number 22. What's very interesting are these next words too. <clears throat> Who are we? Who are we? Who are the people that we're discussing right now? It's Abraham and Isaac. What's the relationship? Father and son. Then it says this. So they went, both of them, together. Who is that? Father and son. So they went, both of them, together. What's it talking about? Father and son. What's in? Who, who do we have in Christ? We have the everlasting Father. We have the unto us. It says that a child is born. And unto us, a son is given. Who is he? He's the everlasting Father. They went both of them together, the Father and the Son. <coughs> the Godhead dwells in Christ. Look at verse 9. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son 
and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Verse 10, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. The Bible's not being dramatic and using a specific type of language. The Holy Spirit cannot lie. Right? It's God's Spirit. You know what, what he was doing here? He took a knife to slay his son. He wasn't... You know, the Bible's telling you what he was doing. It, it's telling you the purpose of his actions. You know why he took that knife? To slay his son. It shows you the, the love, the great love that Abraham had for God. It shows you the great obedience that Abraham had. Abraham is lifted up as a great, a great, great man. And this is, it shows the great faith that he has as well. It says in verse 11, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And then he said, No, I'm just kidding. Verse 12, And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son. Notice what it says again. Thine only son from me. Why is it saying that? Because he was used, Isaac was used as a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ here. We're going to see that further in just a moment. It says, next verse, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and beheld behind him a ram caught in a thicket. What's a thicket? Thorns. That's what a thicket is. It says, caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of. Notice that. In the stead of his son. What's that mean? In the place of his son. What was that ram caught? It was caught in the thicket by his horns. You know what it had on its head? It had horns on its head. It was a ram or a lamb that had horns on its head. Behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And what does that ram or that lamb wear while he's walking up, bearing, bearing the wood? What does he have on his head? Jesus. He's got a crown of thorns on his head, doesn't he? Just like this ram. Notice also it says that it was offered up in the stead of his son. What was Jesus offered up? He was offered up in a literal sense in the stead of his son too, Isaac. Jesus, when he died on the cross, he died for Isaac too. He died for, he died for your son. He died for my son. When you look at this in light of the Passover, what did they do? It was either your son dies just like here in Genesis 22 or this lamb dies, one of the two. So you take your son and, you, and, and with your son you guys go and you, and you gather together you know, and get a, a, a lamb and you prepare this lamb as a sacrifice and you eat this lamb when, you know, for the Passover. And they did this for years and years and years, didn't you? It's, it's identical to what God had Abraham do here. And what is the symbolism? The lamb is dying in place of your son. The lamb is dying in place of your firstborn. Can you imagine being, you know, the child of the, you know, the firstborn son? And you're going out with your dad during the Passover, like in the books of, in the book of Exodus? chapter like, run around like chapter 12 and all that. You have to go out with your dad and get this sacrifice ready to prepare it, right? And you're looking at this lamb dying. Maybe, you know, I'm not trying to be too graphic, but the Bible talks about this kind of stuff. You got to take a knife with your dad and stab that thing. Maybe slit that thing's throat. Blood's running out and everything. You know what you're looking You know what I'd be thinking when I look at that lamb? I'm sure glad that ain't me. Think about that. I'm sure glad that thing, that's happening to that thing instead of me. Think about being Isaac. Do you understand what I'm saying? Think about when all those, all those young boys who were the firstborn that went and helped prepare that lamb. I would sure be happy that that thing died instead of me. Right? I'm thankful that Christ was willing to die in my stead. Amen. That he was willing to go and die in the place of me. Because if he wouldn't have done that, then my head was on the chopping block. Right? right. If he wouldn't have died. If people just think like, you know, here, here's the thing. God obviously planned this from all eternity. God obviously had a perfect plan that he, you know, is, is going to come himself and die on the cross for us. But if we just stop and think hypothetically, if God would not have died for you, you would have went to hell. He would have sent every single person to hell. God's just. Right. And you would have deserved to go. So if it wasn't for that, his death on the cross specifically, that moment in history when he became a man, died on the cross, and then took our punishment to hell, you'd go to hell. 
So be thankful he died instead of you. Be thankful that ram was caught in the thicket. Amen. That that ram was, why was it caught in the thicket? It says God will provide himself. That's a perfect picture of him sending the son, isn't it? You see the layers of symbolism. Now with the ram, what does it represent? Who did, what did Isaac represent? Jesus. What does the ram re represent? Jesus. And the volume of the book is written. Everything points to Jesus. Don't get tired of the symbolism pointing back to Jesus. Because you get, as I said before, you get tired of the Bible. Everything does. The ram is the Lord Jesus Christ being, being offered up instead of Isaac, instead of his son. We see that also happening with Jesus when we see Barabbas. What happens there? There's a swamp thing that goes on, isn't there? In that same situation. And Jesus steps in. Think about that. Jesus died for the sins of Barabbas, didn't he? Barabbas, you get to go. Kind of like Isaac. You can leave. I got somebody taking your place. Even in that, even in that sense. That's, that even becomes, you know, imagine if Barabbas actually got saved. You know, talking to Barabbas about that. He was actually the literal one that was really swapped in the stead of the Lord Jesus Christ coming to die for the sins of the whole world. I'll take your place. I got something I have to do that's pretty important, right? That's powerful. Amen. Look, I want to look at verse number 14. There's some great symbolism. Verse number 14 will compare a prior verse as well. It says this, And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day. And then it says this. It tells you what that means. In the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. So notice what it said. In the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Now, what took place? Here. Us having the whole Bible, what took place here? What did they enact? What did they did they play out? The crucifixion, didn't it? This was a, a, a picture of salvation, wasn't it? So when it says it, because it's like, well, what is it talking about? Because it, it's not. It's a very uh, inexplicit statement, isn't it? In the mouth, in the mouth of the Lord, it shall be seen. When they left, was there anything left there, really? You understand what I'm saying? I mean, there's an altar that he built, but is there anything specifically left there even till this day? He makes the statement, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. When we look at what actually took place here, it was a picture of salvation. It was the, a picture of the crucifixion. So I want you to keep those words in your mind.